Okay, well, family, we have, we have a word today. I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to um, go into this, this wonderful, wonderful passage. I'm going to give you a little bit of context in a moment. Um, before I do so, I want to just begin by sharing an experience that I had some years ago uh, in, in a church far, 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 far away from here. I was the associate pastor at a congregation my first year of ministry. It was the first year of ministry, and it, uh, it happened to be uh, right in the season when Karen and I had just gotten married, and Karen became deathly ill. You've heard us tell the story many times before. Uh, she was literally dying on me the first few months of our marriage. Some of you witnessed that journey with us, and you saw how painful it was. Uh, Karen, Karen had, towards the end of that journey, before God just worked the miracle and made her well, she had a major surgery that was going to be extremely life-threatening. And uh, the, the day of the surgery, we both laid on that bed and we, we wept, we cried, we worshiped, and we, we did not say goodbye, but we knew it could have been a goodbye. We weren't sure if she was going to come out of that surgery well and alive. So when, when, when I'm looking at the picture of this surgery that is coming and the risks in that surgery, I try to make arrangements because in my preaching calendar, I was set to preach that Saturday. I was set to preach that Saturday and uh, it had been scheduled for a while. It was my turn to be on the big stage and, and preach. However, the powers that be, when I shared my desire to remain with my wife and not preach, did not allow me to. I was required to come back the day after my wife's surgery and preach. Now, I didn't know better. Because if y'all were to tell me now, you got to preach, and my wife is on her deathbed, you better believe I would forget I'm a pastor. And I would say stuff that perhaps I would regret later on. You see, I didn't know any better. I was new in the ministry. I said, hey, the Lord is calling me to preach. So I made the mistake of leaving my recently operated wife in the hospital alone. Don't follow my example. And I came to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I preached my heart out on 15 minutes of sleep. I slept on a little chair for 15 minutes that night. I preached my heart out. And you know what? It was a bomb sermon. Like I, I preached my heart out. People were roaring amen. Ladies were waving their hands up in the air. I preached my heart out. I came out afterwards and I'm greeting people at the door. Big old bags under my eyes. And everyone's like, pastor, amen. Pastor, praise the Lord. Pastor, this pastor, that affirmation, affirmation, affirmation. And then that person came. <laughs> this is what I got. Pastor, that was powerful. But your tie's too bright. <laughs> Yo, I, I never wanted, I never went from pastor to, 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 to street, like so fast in my life. I was, I was so upset because here I am giving my absolute everything. I'm giving my absolute best. I made the mistake of leaving my wife behind. I tried to give my best to both God and the church. And all that person had to say was your ties too bright. You know, I hate those buts. I hate those, hey, you're doing well, you're doing great, but, but it is when you introduce that but into your conversation that something just, you know, you, you know what I remembered weeks and weeks after that moment? It wasn't the amens. It wasn't the hallelujahs. It wasn't the lady waving her hand up in the air. It was 
the but. That, that sounds so weird. I just heard myself say that again. I keep doing that, man. It was that moment when the lady's like, but your tie. It sticks with you. And I don't know if it's ever happened to you before, but you're on a hot streak. You're doing great things and you feel people are affirming you. And all of a sudden someone points out the most trivial, the more insi- most insignificant things. And, and all you can think of is that small little observation, that little paper cut, even though everything else is going great, that paper cut is all you can think of. The story we're going to look at today, this, this little passage, is a moment when Jesus is interacting with the church. He's actually sending a message to the church. This church is a literal church in a city called Ephesus. And and Jesus is sending a letter. He's using a vision through this guy named John. And John is writing this message that Jesus has to this church in Ephesus. And Jesus is going to tell the church, hey, you're on a hot streak. You're doing amazing. You're doing incredible. I am so proud of you. But, 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 But let me tell you something. He is not pointing out a bright tie. He's not just pointing out something small and insignificant. What Jesus has to say is, yo, you, you've been on a hot streak. You're doing really great in this, in this, in this, in this, in this. However, and the but he introduces is big. It's significant. It's, it has a weight so much so that it almost reverses everything else they've done in, uh, prior to that. So I want to invite you, join me in Revelation chapter 2 for a bit. Let me give you a little bit of context because this is a series of, of seven letters. Seven letters that God, that, that Jesus is writing, he is giving to his churches. Jesus through vision, he sends the vision over to John. John writes these down and those those, those letters start circulating all over Turkey, all over Asia Minor. They're circulating to seven literal churches. And now uh, the, the, these, these letters are, in, are, are intending to let people know that Jesus is aware of the condition of the church. And these letters are intending to help the church get back on track about a couple things. We're not going to go through all seven letters, but I want us to focus on the very first one. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. If you're with me, just say aloud, amen. Revelation 2, verses 1 through 5. Here we go. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lamps. That's a lot of symbolism. All this means is the one who is giving these words is Jesus who is with the church. He's with the church. He is close to the church. Verse two. Now I know, everyone say, I know. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false, he said. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this thing against you. I have, but I have, but I have this thing against you. You have abandoned your love. You have abandoned your love, church. You have abandoned your love that you had at first. Now remember, therefore, where you came from, where you have fallen from, where you have fallen from, repent and do the works you did at first. So he is sending this letter. He, is, he, is, he starts off saying, hey, there's, you're doing a lot of good things. You're doing a lot of great things. You are on a hot streak, my friends. You're working. You're hustling. Watch, watch, watch verse 2 and 3. It's right there. Verse 2 and 3. I know, he says, I know how hard you work. I know how committed you are to working. He says, I know your works. I know your toil. And I know your patient endurance, he says. You got to understand that the, the, the city of Ephesus... If you were to visit now, a couple of us visited three, visited three, four years ago, 
You go to Ephesus and all you see in every single corner of the city are temples. You see shrines. You see sculptures. You see idols. This is where, you know, the goddess Diana was. And this is where, uh, you know, and you have all these different shrines. There was, there was idolatry. There was other pagan gods being worshipped everywhere. It was a big city full of commerce, full of religion. The most important city around. So you got to understand that the, there, there's, a, there's a couple people that come into Ephesus and they start planting a church. They come to, they, they come to the city, this, this crazy city full of idols. They come and they plant the church. Maybe you've, maybe you've heard the name before. Um, one of them is called John. His last name is the beloved disciple. And the other one is called Mary. Her last name is the mother of Jesus. That's not real her last name, you know that, right? John and Mary go to Ephesus. And it, it is believed that John planted the church in this crazy city. Now, you got to understand that it wasn't popular to be Christian there. You got so many gods, you got so many shrines, you got so many temples, you got so much other stuff going on. It's not popular To be a Christian here. So if you're a Christian in this context, you're essentially a minority roaring against the current. So that patience he's talking about, Jesus saying, hey, I've seen you working in this city. I've seen you working and going against the current. You are countercultural. You are standing up for Christ in a place full of idols. I see you, man. I see you, I see you, I see you. He says, I am aware you cannot bear with those who are evil. I know you stand up for good, Ephesus. I understand, I see you. You're trying to do what is right in a culture that is full of wrong. You're trying to do what is good in a culture that is full of evil. You have even tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, but are found to be false. He's saying, hey, with all these crazy, kooky people teaching all these things, all these crazy, kooky people coming into the church and teaching all these crazy things, you are straight. You're standing up for truth. You're not being swayed by just any philosophy. You are right there. You are focused on my truth. Yo, that sounds like an amazing church to belong to. A church that works. A church that stands firm and is bold in the midst of this culture of idolatry. A church that cares about truth. Watch, watch, watch. I, I, I keep reading here. I know you're enduringly patient, uh, enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. And you have not grown weary. So this church, if you look at the description, I don't know about you, but that's the kind of church I want to belong to. I want to, I want to belong to this kind of body. But, but, but watch, because as we have said before, as Jesus is complimenting and he's saying all the good things, all he, he's essentially diagnosing this hot streak that the church is going through. Watch the butt. Watch what Jesus then says in verse 4. But, can we, can we read that together nice and loud? But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Okay, so you, you, got, you got doctrine right. You know what to believe. You're working hard. You're doing the right things. So you're believing the right things. You're working and and doing the right things. However, there's something that you have lost. That initial passion that you had when you and I hooked up. When you and I became, became friends, when you and I became savior and redeemed, that, that, that first fire, you've lost it. Now, 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 most of us in the room perhaps don't even remember our first fire. Yeah, I, was, I was thinking, I was thinking, I was thinking this week of that day when I got baptized. As a matter of fact, just uh, March 28th this year, Turned like 27 years of being baptized. My girl looked at me. She's like, I thought you were 27. I'm like, thank you, baby. I'm not 27. 
I got baptized when I was about to turn 10. 1992. I remember because it was the year of the Olympics. It was Barcelona Olympics. Michael Jordan just tore it up over there. And it was, ah, good year. I remember the day I got baptized. It was about 1,500 people in a church, just massive church. Insane, just huge. I went in there and just with my best friend, Ivaldo, at the same time in the same tank. Like they dunked us at the same time. It was just glorious. Just, just, I remember just coming out, just feeling so happy and alive. I was nine. Pastor Bullion had just preached. Yeah, if you, you heard Pastor Bullion. If, you're, if you've been in the church long enough, you know Pastor Bullion. You know who he is. He, 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 he preached a sermon and he, he called for baptisms. And all of a sudden, this little nine-year-old boy just popped up out of the seat and was the first one to run to the front. That was me. I was so in love with Jesus at the age of nine. I was so in love with Jesus. I got baptized that day. And I remember just, just feeling like I was walking on water from that moment on. I was just so, so happy and so on fire at my nine-year-old self. I remember every single Saturday night, we would come together and, and, and go out to town you know, with a bunch of kids, 40, 50 kids, every Saturday night, just playing out in the streets, hide and go seek. We would play soccer. We would play kickball. And every single night without fail, let me, let me confess some stuff to you, every single night without fail, every single Saturday night before fail, your pastor would get in a fight. Every single night. I, like my parents would walk around the perimeter and they would find a pile of children and down at the bottom of that pile would be your pastor just pounding on somebody. That was, that's, okay, I'm, just, I'm just confessing right now. Jesus has made me well though. Okay. <laughs> Preach. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Now it's just every other week. So, I, so I, I'm going to the battlefield. It's Saturday night. You know, we play soccer and we fight. You know, that's, that's what we do on Saturday night. And I remember going to play soccer with these kids. I'm going to the same place. I'm going with the same people. And that, those other kids were there and they were ready to get down. I remember thinking to myself and saying it, no, not today. And I remember right there in front of 40 kids I told them, I just got baptized. I'm not even a day old. My nine-year-old bold little self is preaching the gospel to a bunch of little kids. Now, I got in a fight the week after, right? That, that, that kept happening, but, but there was some boldness. There was this fire in me at nine years old that kept, kept me just wanting to speak about Jesus and let everyone know I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Now, now, I want you to see, though, because this church at one point had that fire. They had that fire, but Jesus' indictment to this church is, hey, you're doing all the work. You're saying all the right things. You're, you're going to church. You're worshiping. You're working. But you lost that thing, man. You lost it. That first love, that, that, that fervent love, you lost it. Now, now if, if you see on the screen, it says, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the, what is that word? Love. Now, we've talked about this before. This is going to be a little review for some of you. This may be the first time you hear this. When we are talking about love as a Greek idea, there's several forms of love that we can be referring to. The first one is called eros, eros love. That's, those, these are three aspects, three forms of love. The first one is eros. You hear the word erotic coming out of this. Eros is the kind of love that just tries to get something from you. It's the kind of love that receives. The kind of love that asks the question, hey, what can I get from this? Are you following and then there's a second one, a second kind of love called phileo. Everyone say phileo. This love is an exchange. It's a love that you're like, okay, so, so, so Claudia, I'm going to get you this for Christmas. What are you going to get me? That's, that's how we exchange our love. It's, it's I'm giving you because I'm expecting to get something back. You got some friends like that, huh? They, 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 they try to be your friends. They try to come close, but you know, they just want something back. Just wink, amen, just because you may be sitting next to them right now. <laughs> so you got Eros love, we ask the question, 
What am I going to? And then you have phileo love that asks the question, what am I going to exchange, right? It's convenient. But the word that Jesus is saying, you have lost your first love, is the word agape. The word agape is not selfish. It's not convenient. The word agape is passionate. The word agape agape does not ask the question, what am I going to get from you or what are we going to exchange? The word agape says, hey, what am I going to get? What what am I going to give to you? Are you following? So, So it's not just what am I getting from this transaction? What am I getting from you? The word agape actually is saying, hey, what am I going to give you? What is coming from me over to you? And I want you to understand what Jesus is telling Ephesus, they lost. He is saying, you have lost your agape. Okay, I'm going I'm to help you here, okay? Let me help you. You have lost your agape. You still have your eros. You still have your phileo with me. Like you're so into my blessings. I know you love me because you want me to bless you. Like I know you love me in a phileo kind of love because here you are putting in work in order to get something from me. What you have lost is that passionate love that gives without expecting to receive. (laughs) Anyone lost your first love? Anyone just in it for the blessing? Anyone just in it? Anyone just here because you're putting, you're adding into your account, hoping to get that promotion you've been praying for? And you're like, you know what? I I really want to get this. Therefore, I'm going to volunteer at the church. So that we can create this exchange. And as I give God my time, he can give me his blessings. That is the gospel of Chance the Rapper, my friends. When the praises go up, the blessings come down. Girl, you need Jesus. <laughs> we need, we, but you know what? You know what? That's been my story. That's been my story. I can't tell you how many times I've worshipped because I had a need. I worshipped trying to please God and not because he is worthy. That indictment is for people like me. I need Jesus. So he's telling them, hey, you've lost that agape. You've lost that selfish, that, that selfish, that, that passionate love. And, and I, I want you to see, I want you to see this because notice how they have their doctrine right. They, 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 they're standing up for truth, Kaleo. They're standing up for the right understanding of God, the right understanding of the Bible. They're standing up for the right things, and they're doing the right things. Are you following me? Can, can, can I get technical? You, you all know I like to preach and teach sometimes. Can I, can I teach a little bit? You don't have a choice. Here we go. <laughs> There's three O words that I want to share with you. We've talked about these before. We talked about two. I want to share a third one. There's a word called orthodoxy. Everyone say orthodoxy. Orthodoxy essentially means believing the right things. That's what orthodoxy means. And I I strongly believe in the need for orthodoxy, Antoine. We need to believe the right things. We need to care about the truth of the Bible. Amen? And there's another word called orthopraxy. And it's practicing or doing the right things. So notice how the, 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 the church in Ephesus has orthodoxy down. And they have orthopraxy down, but they're missing the third O. And this is a word called orthopathy. Everyone say orthopathy. Pretend you learned something at church today. Come on. 
orthopathy. Orthopathy essentially means that you have the right belief, not the right emotions and the right passions. Now, let me tell you, let me be specific here because every single one of us has a passion. Every single one of us in this place is passionate about something. Are we not? I mean, I've seen you all during the World Series two years in a row. Stop it. You have a Boston fan in the house. We've seen you during, during World Series. We've seen you during the World Cup. We see how you get about the music you like. We see how you get about your, your girlfriend or your boyfriend. We see how you get about We are passionate people. But are we passionate about the right things? Have you ever been moved as much with Jesus as you have been in the World Series? Have you ever been moved as much with Jesus as you have been when you got that first text message from that girl? You're like, man, I actually have a chance. That's the kind of stuff that takes your sleep away. When was the last time you were not able to sleep because you kept thinking about the goodness of Jesus? You see, we're passionate people. But do we have the right passions? Do, do, we, do we really, do we really, can we really say that we are as passionate about Jesus as we are passionate about all these other things here on earth? So he says, you got orthodoxy down, you got orthopraxy down, you got orthopathy down, but you are, I'm sorry, you, you have orthodoxy, orthopraxy, but you do not have orthopathy down. You are not Passionate. And let me tell you something. Christianity without passion will die. You can't just come to church and go through the motions and pretend you're going to be good for the rest of your life if you are not passionate about Jesus. Yo, I've seen people who are passionate about Jesus. I've told you a story about Fernando before. Fernando's a guy I baptized. The guy was like two times my size. His biceps were the size of my head. The guy was massive. He had just come out of prison. He had been in prison for a horrendous crime. He learned about Jesus while he was in prison. He fell in love with Jesus when he, he, when he came out of prison. He came straight to the church from prison, and I was assigned the task to baptize this guy. I was, I was so scared when I saw him, but when I heard him speak about Jesus, this brother was a big tattooed teddy bear who just loved Jesus. I baptized this guy and I will never forget his passion because he wanted to be everything in the church. They would ask for volunteers. He was the first one there. They would ask for, 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 for any support, any help, any attendance, bring visitors. He would bring everyone he could from the street. I literally saw him chasing someone down the street with a sentinella in his hand. Now, you see a guy looking like that, running after you. You're not thinking Jesus. He was running down, telling someone Jesus loves you. But he, all they saw was a dude just doing this behind them. I, he loved Jesus. One time we were looking at some signups for ministries. We had, you know, this ministry and this ministry and volunteers would come and sign up for them. I, I looked at, at, at one that said, Diagonisas. Diaconisa is a female deacon. I saw his name on top. <laughs> he didn't care. He just wanted to serve Jesus. That's what Jesus is telling Ephesus. Hey, you've missed, you, you're missing this thing. You're working. You're showing up. You're giving your time. You're giving your tithes, but you lack the heart. You lack that passion. You lack, you lack. Hey, and let me tell you something. Uh, I'm going to get real right now. Is that okay? I've had a short sleep, so I, you can't control me today. I can't have not slept. Allison's about to yank me off stage. Let me be. We can tell when you lost. We can tell. You know, when church members hurt each other, it's usually people who don't have the passion anymore. People who have replaced passion with judgmentalism. People who have replaced the passion with, with a spirit 
of criticism. They are joyless and they come to church looking for a bright tie to critique. We've lost it. And we can tell. We hurt one another when we lose it. I I never give you lists, but I'm going to give you two lists today. And you you can write these down. We're going to go quick, okay? I'm going to give you the perfect recipe. Listen to me carefully. I'm going to give you the perfect recipe to lose your passion. Okay? If you want to lose your passion with Jesus, just do what's going to be on the screen in a moment, okay? Just just take notes. If you really want to lose your passion, this is what you got to do. Number one, ignore the person of God. No, 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 no. You're like, what, what does that mean? You see, many of us have been in the church so long, we see God as an idea, not a person. We see God as a belief. It's up here with no personality. We we have lost the relationship, the personhood of the God who created us and is looking to have a relationship with us. If you want your passion to die, change the category of God from person to doctrine or idea or belief. Are you following? That's it. If you want to live a passionless life. Number two, if you want to lose that fire, that passion in your life, neglect worship prayer, and study. Now, notice how I'm not saying read for information, church. I'm saying, and I'm not even saying come to worship. I'm saying you, in the quietness of your home, worship the maker of heaven and earth. If you want your passion to remain alive, that needs to be central in your life. You got to worship, you got to study the word of God, and you got to pray and pray and pray. If you want to lose it, forget these three. The third one, center your life on yourself. Don't worry about the needs of others. Don't worry about volunteering at church. Focus on yourself. Focus on your preference. Focus on your comfort. Focus on your styles, on your needs. Focus on yourself. Here's a fourth one. Do faith alone. Just watch us online. Just just, just log in to a church online. Get your your Jesus fix for the day and, and keep on going. Don't do church with other believers. You really want to lose your passion, just do God isolated from everyone else. Here's the last one. Get over the cross. You want to lose your passion, Kaleo? You want to be that lifeless church? Get over the cross. You know what I see in the Bible? This fires me up. What I see in the Bible is every scene of heaven, people are saying, holy, holy, holy. People are shouting. People are worshiping God. You know why? Time and time again, he is called the lamb that was slain. He is called the one who died and rose again. Every single scene of worship in in, in the scriptures Center on Jesus as the sacrificial lamb of God. You know what that means? Heaven is not over the cross. They can't stop talking about it. They can't stop seeing about it. They can't stop reflecting on it. And let me tell you something. If you want to kill your passion for Jesus, ignore the fact that you were on his mind when he hung on that cross. But if you want to keep it alive, go back to Calvary. Go back to the cross. See yourself in the mind of the Son of God. You see, that's what what these Ephesians were going through. And that's why Jesus is saying, hey, you're doing all the right things. But you're you're not passionate about me anymore. I'm going to give you one more list and I'm going to land this plane. Okay, is that okay? Y'all okay? 
Here's why. Here's why you and I want to be set on fire. How many of us want to be set on fire? Just, just, just shout, shout aloud, amen. amen. I, I, I don't know. I, life without passion just makes no sense to me. I want to be set on fire. I want, I want to think about the cross and just break down in tears. Like that's, that's the kind of life I want to, I want to, <laughs> I want to be like the lady I met at the Melrose outpost place. My wife and I sometimes just go and just people watch some strange people out there. <laughs> so, so we, we, we would go and we just, we just walk and, and we just look at people and, and, and there's this lady, there's this lady, this lady who, who we went up to because we saw she was selling soaps and we saw like some of the, the styles. One of them was like, like horchata soap. I'm like, <laughs> chocolate soap. Like all these soaps. And I'm looking at all the, and I'm like, I'm asking my wife, how do we? And I just, I, when I said the word how, it's like she supernaturally heard me from across and rushed over and leaned over the counter and said, let me tell you how. <laughs> And she just started explaining because she was a creator of it. She, she was a maker of it. And her eyes lit up and there was this big just radiance around her because she was talking about soap. But you know what? There was a passion. There was a passion to what she was saying. So, so I know we want to live with that same kind of passion for God. Let me tell you what we get when God lights our hearts back on fire. Are you ready? You can write this down. This, this is what we get. Our beliefs become boldness. Like right now, you believe that Jesus is coming soon, but you are not bold about it. Your neighbors don't even know the fact that you believe that there is a God in heaven who is coming back to take you to live eternally with you. Your neighbors don't know that. All you have is belief, but you lack the boldness. Are you following? When you're set on fire, your desire will become desperation. How many of us are desperate for God? No, like some of you may be desperate for food more than you are for God. I'm talking about desperate. I'm talking about I can't think without him. I can't breathe without him. I can't function without him. If you are set on fire, your desire will become desperation. How many of us want that in our lives? Watch, number three, your prayers will become soul cries. They will become soul cries. Rather than the formal, Padre nuestro que estás en el cielo, santificado, Yo, know, Sometimes your prayers will just be one word, Jesus. And it's going to come from the bottom of your heart, just filled with sincerity. Another one that, 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 that is added, so this is our experience when we're light, lit up for, for Jesus. The word in our minds will become the word in our hearts. And here's my desire. Knowing God will become experiencing God. Family, this, this has to be our pursuit. This has to be our greatest desire. Not to live a passionless life for Jesus, but rather just just turn our hearts, our entire hearts, to live a life passion for Jesus. Now, how do we do this? I, I, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna land this here. How do we do this? Revelation 2, 5, right there. That's the answer. Revelation 2, 5, he says, uh, he's telling John to write to Ephesus. Now, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Remember, therefore, what, what, from where you have fallen. That word remember essentially means the following. You got to slow down. You got to just put your phone aside. You got to put Netflix, just turn it off for a bit. You got to get off social media for a bit. You got to stop, break, you, you got to break the rhythm of your life. You may have to take a weekend off. You may have to take a, a, a vacation off. You, know, you, you may have to just slow down and take a season to remember the good old days. And you know what good old days I'm talking about. The days when you just felt the closest to Christ. The days when you became aware that Jesus was your Messiah, that Jesus was your Savior. He's saying, hey, if you want to reignite this thing, you got to remember. Every single time I baptize someone, I pull them aside. And without fail, whenever I pull them aside, this is when the person breaks down. 
And if I baptize you, you know exactly the moment I'm talking to you. I pulled you aside. I looked at you straight in the eyes and I told you, you need to remember this moment. You need to remember this moment right now. Remember the songs we're singing. Remember the, 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 the people that are sitting around. Remember the sounds. Remember the sights. Remember the smells. Remember the, everything. You need to remember why. Because five years from now, you're going to go through hell and back. And you're going to need an anchor to hold on to. And this is your moment. Family, most of us have taken off in our spiritual walk and we have not taken the time to remember where we came from. And we came from a moment when we we had an encounter with Jesus. Jesus swept us off our feet. He wooed us. He changed our hearts. We decided to give our lives to him. If we can just go back to that and, and ground ourselves from that moment. And that's what Jesus is telling the Ephesians. Go back, remember, slow down, and remember the moment I swept you off your feet. And let me tell you what the good news about this is. You can go back. You can remember. Notice what, what he says here. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen. And then he says the word repent. You know what the word repent means? Turn around and go back. Turn around and go back. As a matter of fact, next slide. That, that would be the most accurate, accurate translation. He's saying, hey, remember when we used to be tight. Remember when you and I used to be madly in love with each other. Kaleo, remember, remember, remember the first time you realized that the cross was for you. You'd heard about the cross all your life, but but when you realized the man on the cross was your guy, and that cross was something you deserved, and that cross was something that you had earned, but in his love, he said, you know what? The cross doesn't fit me because it's made your size. This crown doesn't fit me because it's, it was meant and made for you. But I'm getting on this thing so that you can be alive. Remember, remember. Do you, do you even remember? Do you remember when you, when you heard the gospel and your heart was just confronted by the beauty that is Jesus? Do you remember? Do you remember how you felt like you could walk on water? Do you remember how you felt you could conquer anything? You could heal anybody because you had the Spirit of God inside of you. Do you remember the moment when you went from living in shame because of those dark mistakes you made in your life? to all of a sudden experiencing the freedom, knowing that you have been forgiven. Do you remember that? Do you remember when you came face to face with your addiction and you told Jesus, hey, from now on, this is your problem to solve and you experience freedom for the first time. You start, you put the bottle down You stop calling that person. You ended that relationship. You never picked up the pipe again. Do you remember that? Jesus is saying, hey, I want want you to be passionate about me, but you have strayed away. You have fallen from this. Remember that place where we were tight, where we were intimate, where we were just so close with one another. Remember it and go back. And family, I believe that he's inviting every listener to go back to the cross. Go back to the cross. Go back to the cross. You may just have to go home right after this and kneel down and give God thanks for the cross right after church. 
You may just have to. You may just have to open up that dusty Bible you have in the back of your car. Go to the book of Matthew. Go to the book of John and open up these pages and see the cross once again because you've lost your passion. Oh, you have perfect attendance in church? You give your tithe and more? You give your time? You give, you give, you give. But your heart's not in it. Cleo, we need to go back. We need to go back. And, and, and let me, let, I'm done, I'm done, I promise. I said I'm done like, four, like 15 minutes ago, but I'm still here. Let me tell you something. This is a promise that I believe God makes to his people. If you go back to the cross, he will do it again. You can't set yourself on fire. You can't accomplish this thing on your own. You can't just muster up passion in your heart. If that's what you, what you heard today, please, please, please do not misunderstand. Passion is not something that we generate. It's something that becomes a reaction to something beautiful you and I come across. So I'm inviting you as Jesus is inviting us, let's go back to the cross. Go back to the cross. Go back and see your Savior on that cross. Put your eyes on that Savior. Yo, I was, I was driving out here in traffic and, and I broke down, literally just broke down. It may be just my lack of sleep. I don't know. But I was, my heart was heavy, church. At the thought that someone is listening to me today and has no clue what I'm talking about. You've been in church all your life and you have never had passion for Jesus. There's no books about it. There's no seminars to get you back. The only way to set your, your heart on fire is go to the cross. Just go to the cross. Go to the cross. That, that will set you up. And God will do it again. I have a special invitation today. I know today's topic was a bit heavy. We have a lot going on as a church. We got Easter coming up. We're telling you to please invite somebody. But what's the point if you yourself are not on fire? What's the point of you drawing people close to Jesus if Jesus is just a fixture in your life? We need to be set on fire. We want Jesus to do it again. And here's my, my, my calling, my invitation. The worship team is going to come up in a moment. They're going to lead us in this beautiful, beautiful song. Here's my invitation to you. Are there any Ephesians in the house? Any Ephesians in the house who you've heard about Jesus? You've been tight with Jesus in the past. You've been on fire before. You were passionate at one point. And now you're just going through the motions. And today, in front of your friends and family, you want to say, I am drawing near to the cross. And while I don't believe there's anything magical that happens when you step up, there's something when you walk, when you come forth, when you take a stand, there's something about the body moving that confirms what the spirit is going through. And if this is you and you want to say, Lord, today, by faith, I am taking a step towards the cross. As the worship team leads us in this song, I just want, you to, invite, I want to invite you to join me up here. We're going to sing together. We're going to worship together. Put a hand on somebody. Let's sing this beautiful song about the cross. And we're going to end up with a prayer. Can we stand together, please? Lord, we stand before you. We kneel before you. We fall before you. Completely unable to be reunited on our own. All we've done is draw close to the cross. We drew near. That's it. Do it again, Lord. Do it again. 
beyond this moment, beyond the emotions of right now. Do it again and do it again tomorrow morning. Do it again on Monday morning, God. When we walk into that workplace or into that classroom, that somehow someone may perceive something different about us, that our belief may be boldness, that our desire may be desperation, that our prayers may become soul cries. God, do it again. Do it again. Do it again. We don't want to live a passionless life. Do it again, God. Set us on fire, Lord. Set us on fire. 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 If this is your desire, you just tell him that. Set us on fire. Set us on fire. Set us on fire, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. We love you. We will continue to draw near and seek that first love. In Jesus' name and all those who agree, said a loud amen.